proper I would like to bid uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and selamat pagi uh, to everyone so we are going to run the session in English um, uh, and of course um, uh, you can ask uh, questions Uh, but before you can ask questions, um, uh, there were there are a list of uh, a set of questions that EDEC uh, has uh, prepared uh, so that we can um, pick the brains of our new uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Prof. Yatima, um, and um, to uh, explain to us and also to, um, uh, to show us how uh, UM and also um, uh, the TNCA is moving forward with uh, our uh, future of uh, teaching and learning in the university. Um, so I just noticed that um, actually my, my, uh, my camera is not that, that good in the quality and I may need to turn the blinds off for a little bit. Okay. Hopefully that is uh, better uh, for everyone. So the the contrast is uh, not that bad. Okay. So um, again, um, uh, we bid uh, uh, a welcome to everybody, and we uh, so the, the flow of the session is uh, we will start with uh, a few questions for uh, our deputy vice chancellor. Uh, and uh, the participants from different faculties uh, are uh, invited to ask uh, questions as well uh, in the chat. Okay, so uh, you can actually go uh, at the bottom of the screen, and you can see the the the, the, the chat um, uh, button there. You can ask ask question, maybe a follow up question from the the, the main question that we have, also or or. Uh, a question in in response to uh, our uh, vice deputy vice chancellor's um, uh, follow up and also uh, uh, feedback. Okay, um, uh, we will choose the questions to be asked um, uh, be in the in the interest of time um, and also the interest of um, making sure that we don't sort of repeat the same uh, question. And for those who have um, have their questions chosen, chosen, I would uh, like uh, for you to open your mic and then ask the questions uh, yourself. Okay, so uh, coming it from, uh, it coming from uh, yourself, I think we make it more interactive and more engaging. Okay, it's not just um, me uh, having a, an interview with uh, our uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, but also uh, you can also uh, engage with her. I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, Prof has uh, had a, uh, like a large engagement uh, with uh, the whole of the campus university uh, before this, uh, since you uh, uh, take the office? Uh, not yet. Uh, not not yet. Uh, so this, this will be our first time. Yes, that's very good. That's very good. Okay. So, um, and after we've uh, exhausted the, the list of questions uh, that uh, EDEC has prepared, uh, then we will have an open session until we... Uh, finish uh, at uh, 12 o'clock for uh, everybody to ask um, the uh, the questions um, with regards to teaching and learning um, uh, moving forward uh, into the future that uh, you might have you might have uh, your own burning questions that you want you wanted to uh, ask um, or get the get the the my get the opinion of uh, our uh, deputy vice chancellor uh, uh, prof yatima okay so Uh, let's begin uh, with the uh, the round of questionings uh, from uh, the questions that we uh, have uh, thought of uh, to ask our question. And I think the, the best, uh, the, the first questions that uh, we should ask is actually more, more of like umbrella uh, question uh, based on uh, UM's um, direction moving forward with our uh, strategic plan and also transformation plan. So as the new um, Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, for Academic and Inter International, uh, which of the strat UM strategic plan um, that you think will make the biggest impact uh, to teaching and learning? And how is your office uh, supporting uh, the achievement of this uh, strategic planning that uh, we already have? 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Zahir, our colleague. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to all. Salam Ramadan. InsyaAllah, Hari Raya will be coming soon. Eh? Okay, uh, this is really a burning question. I think this is my first engagement with the uh, academics, uh, particularly. But I've been um, communicating quite often uh, with the uh, deans and deputy deans and under uh, certain certain uh, committee members as well. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very uh, good opportunity for me to speak and to share okay, the aspirations of moving forward, okay, especially uh, under my portfolio, Academic International. Okay, uh, talking about this uh, strategy and transformation plan, I believe that uh, academics have heard uh, quite often from our, our previous uh, DBC ANA, Prof. Kamila, as well as uh, the team uh, from the transformation plan as well. So I hope they have actually uh, done quite a massive engagement before this. But what I would like to share with you is very much focusing on the uh, portfolio of under uh, my jurisdiction, basically on the academic and also some part of the internationalization. Okay, so I think uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, impacts on teaching and learning, I think will be under theme two, okay, which is reimagine education at UM. Okay, so uh, uh, actually, I, uh, I was uh, I, I lead the task force, okay, under Reimagine Education, together with Prof Abizra, and we basically have a few task force members uh, contributing to these directions. So basically, we have uh, four main aspirations and objectives under this Reimagine Education at UM. First, on the curriculum flexibility and agility. Second shift in digital practices and reskilling in pedagogy. Third, future-driven internationalization and global education. And finally, nurture learners as agents of innovation and change. So these are the four main aspirations and objectives being laid under the Reimagine Education at UM. Okay? Just to share you some some uh, 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 goals, okay? What what uh, we're thinking on it? What are the priority that be given under these uh, four main uh, objectives under reimagine education? Uh, definitely, you know what we target to increase learner choice and encouraging flexible learning. Okay, so this focus on what we call it flexible curriculum. We'll be introducing a flexible minor package. Inshallah, in the coming semester, we start in semester one, session 22-23. It means that for major academic program, okay, we are offering some minor packages. So this is will be more flexible curriculum, what we call it. In other words, where the students can actually uh, take some package, okay, uh, beyond their own discipline. Okay, it can be cross disciplines as well. For example, students doing major in chemistry, they can take uh, electives or minors package from economy, for example. So we have uh, abundance of choices under these packages because to date, what I can say, we have select 27 major academic program, okay, to start with this flexible curriculum. We, are, we could not... Uh, uh, we, we can't do 100% okay, with this current uh, situation because of the um, uh, some uh, challenges you know, that we face. So we start with 27 academic programs, what we call it under the category of major uh, academic program. Okay? Uh, and then we also uh, moving forward definitely to, to enhance more on the skills, especially implementing more innovative approaches in teaching and learning. Okay. Uh, at the same time, okay, we're charting new strategy as well to look at the vision and models for internalization and global education. Okay, because as we know now, uh, uh, there are quite uh, uh, extensive uh, approaches, different approach uh, elsewhere. You know, to make sure that the education system, you know, is is um, is marketable, relevant to the trends, and 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 so on. So this is where we also uh, need to look uh, into that. And finally, to building sustainable industry academia collaboration and scholastic partnerships. 
I believe that this has been ongoing. Okay, there are quite numbers of programs, especially uh, ongoing. For example, uh, Elite at UM, we have started uh, since last session. Uh, where uh, the, uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Wendy is actually working on the Elite at UM program with a team at ETJ levels. And we have the uh, industries coming to join in in the teaching and learning activities. Okay. Okay. Shall, we shall work on the details of this. Okay. For example, uh, when we talk about uh, increasing learner's choice, we are actually now in the almost in finalizing state where we create a more flexible and agile curriculum as well as say because uh, uh, we are focusing on the 27 academic program to start with on undergraduates okay uh, and uh, we want to make sure that we encourage more creative learning and innovative teaching through our greater digital uptake and reskilling in pedagogy i think we have started in this uh, activity since we are facing pandemic we are now in transition to endemic period and I believe the skills that all the academics have and had already, I think uh, it's really uh, in a very, uh, very, very, I would say that congratulations to all, you know, uh, finally, we, we, we actually can do 100% e-learning, you know, where I think last three years, we started with only like 10 to 20%, you know, doing e-learning in campus. But with the pandemic uh, situation, I think we moved to 100%, which is very, very good. Okay. So uh, uh, if you look at the overall uh, uh, aspiration, you know, we are moving from knowledge base to more learner-centered education system, okay? Where we believe that flexibility, personal, personalization, interdiscipline, uh, uh, especially nowadays, you know, when, when uh, the KPT announced what they call it Excel framework, experiential learning and uh, competency-based landscape, you know, where we have to move forward to make sure that uh, our graduates be competent in certain areas, okay? So that we will fulfill the diverse future needs for our students itself. So, uh, sorry, there is no uh, slides, okay? I just, you know, as what uh, the, uh, the uh, chairman said, it will be more interactive and giving more input, okay? All right, so, uh, uh, so, Overall, okay, we have aims okay, to make sure that uh, this uh, we achieve, okay. So I really need all the academic to support, okay, especially uh, on teaching and learning where we need to work, you know, uh, with partnership, especially with our own client, which is student, uh, with stakeholders, industry, okay, to, to create a community of excellence in education. So I think with the help and with the commitment of our academics, Inshallah, okay, uh, our task is to nurture our future talents as agent of innovation and change, okay? And uh, at the same time, okay, uh, we also need to fulfill the diverse future needs of society, okay, out there. We, we know that uh, uh, the, 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 the job market very much needed a graduate with a high level competency, okay? So I believe that as an educators, as an academics in UM, I think we should be hand in hand together, okay, to make sure that the graduates uh, have that quality of uh, uh, competency to work in a job market. So as an academic as well, I believe that uh, we have to uh, uh, support, okay, and deliver the highest levels of student satisfaction especially embracing digital opportunities and pedagogical agility. So we uh, make sure that it's at, at the heart of the students, you know, to, to receive this kind of uh, uh, teaching and learning delivery from, from, uh, from our academics. So what values us basically uh, to, to make sure these uh, goals, you know, are being achieved, we, we are thinking on uh, making sure that, you know, a diversity, okay, diversity take into that uh, values, inclusivity and collaboration, okay, to make sure that uh, uh, we can apply knowledge to solve the real life problems, okay. Uh, so I think that's, that's uh, overall that I can share with you uh, what we lay uh, in, in our uh, theme two in transformation plan. As you know, transformation plan will take like 10 years uh, from now, okay? Uh, hopefully with some strategic plans under the portfolio of this uh, 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 DBC a and a okay? I think we, we inshallah, we, we can try uh, to make sure that things will happen in future. 
uh, I hope that you know it aspires everybody uh, moving forward under under this portfolio. I think there are some questions. I think Prof Siti that states a question. <laughs> Ah, uh, Prof. Prof. Mungkin, uh, mungkin kita boleh. Uh, so maybe we can uh, get uh, uh, Prof. Siti to uh, turn on your mic, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Z. Um, good morning, Prof. Yatima. Morning. Salam sejahtera. Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, asking on the philosophical shift uh, that we are anticipating to meet the new challenges. It's a very different challenges. Everybody have been shaken to the ground that the role of education probably in, instead of just filling in information we should fill in also the purpose so in that direction can you share with us some of these philosophical shift that we are you know we are embarking on thank you bro thank you prof city okay thank you bro i try i try to to answer based on uh, what i understand on the uh, main philosophy behind these changes okay uh, I think what we can we can see here we have uh, quite a number of uh, activities you know to shift uh, from um, knowledge centric to learner centric okay I think this moving forward uh, in in some of the activities and also um, uh, learning pedagog pedagogy is very very important uh, when you talk about this uh, shift, okay, on uh, teaching and learning, it covers uh, uh, not only on the curriculum, but also on the delivery and also assessment, okay? So, means when we have that uh, in mind, okay, it will go parallel in terms of shifting from knowledge to learner-centric. Okay, so what, what, what is important here is that, okay, besides having some... Uh, 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 what they call it, uh, uh, the, the blue shift from the Ministry of Higher Education, okay, where we want to have more holistic uh, students okay, that we can actually produce, or maybe the graduates which have all these uh, values okay, and also knowledge and also competency. So um, we, we also need to uh, embed ourselves, the heart of it, to make these changes for uh, our students. Okay? So uh, in, in that in that uh, uh, in that in mind, okay, what I believe it is that uh, we we don't want to just have a one way communication with the students. We want two ways on and more interactive sessions with the students because with the current uh, uh, generation, okay, we can see that they are more proactive. They are more. Uh, uh, um, uh, how how they call vigilant okay in certain certain things you know they are vibrant you know they are, they want to know the real how to solve the real issues it's not only talking about fundamental and theories they want more applied and they want more to actually solving the real life uh, issues okay so i think that's the main uh, 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 philosophy behind why we change this uh, landscape all right uh, I think uh, in, in our pedagogical skills as well, in, in the delivery part, I think we also need to change ourselves. Uh, and we know that uh, it, it's a blessing as well as what I said earlier, uh, that we can do all this uh, hybrid learning, you know, hybrid learning, looking at more uh, 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 creative, innovative kind of teaching and learning with different kind of delivery method as well as assessment. Even uh, I've, I've actually announced that we're going to have the physical mode very soon, which is after a year. And I hope that PTJ have actually prepared themselves to do that. But at the same time, you know, we still have students who cannot come in campus to campus. Uh, students still are doing remote learning because of the constraint at their home uh, place and so on. So I think uh, this uh, still will carry on with this kind of um, uh, delivery and also assessment. And these are the things that, you know, um, um, uh, the, the, the main uh, activities that we're going to make sure that it's happening with this transition uh, between pandemic to endemic uh, situation. So I think I hope that it's answered some of your question, uh, Prof. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think um, I, I, I really like the, uh, the four aspirations that uh, Prof Yatima spoke about just now about uh, curriculum flexibility, shift in digital and sort of scaling. 
uh, future and global education also uh, learn as an agent of change. And from all the four, uh, I find that do, two or three uh, is directly direct uh, directly related to our function as lecturers, <laughs> isn't it? As educators. And then only the last one, learners as uh, agents of change. So that that goes the 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 aspiration goes to the learners so uh, yeah i mean uh, it's it's a it's a vibrant time that i think uh, we uh, uh, we can actually rise uh, to the challenge and uh, of course with the uh, offering of the the minor package i think uh, that is something that uh, we can look forward to um on just uh, just one uh, uh, small question about that that, that uh, uh, major and minor package will it make the uh, student uh, graduates Make, will it make it the, make the students have to like uh, spend their time in the university longer, uh, Prof? Because of doing minor, minor and major? Okay, uh, that's good questions. I think every one of us also want to know how we're going to implement this. Okay, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have selected 27 program which under the category of major. Okay, it means that a major discipline. Uh, if we look at the nomenclature, it just clearly stated, for example, Bachelor of uh, Chemist, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry means it's just was one major discipline. We need to select this uh, major program only to implement uh, on this first phase is because we don't need to change any major curriculum structure. Okay, because in a major category curriculum, we have like 70%, uh, 50 to 70% carries the major discipline and the rest are elective and university courses. Okay, what we can implement for this uh, particular approach on the package, elective package is we are using the elective package to consider not only under their own discipline, but also they can take from other disciplines. It means that we don't touch any elective uh, uh, portion, okay, elective category uh, courses. So then if we uh, have put like, for example, in the curriculum structure, the elective courses taken up about 30 credits, then the 30 credits the students can take from economy, for example, the student can take the 30 credits from uh, uh, social sciences faculty, because we have requested every PTJs to provide the elective packages so that the students can take these electives beyond their own discipline. The students can still take some electives from their own program. For example, they are major in chemistry, they want to take elective in chemistry, they can do so. But if they want to take electives in economy, they also can do so. And they have to just fulfill the 30 credits. Okay, so basically, basically we don't change any uh, major curriculum structure. It just stays as this is, and the fulfillment of credits remain the same. If it says to fulfill that 130 credits, the 130 credit remains the same. The only difference is that in their transcript, okay, we'll put that my uh, elective package. So if they take 30 credits from economy, they can have the uh, electives stated in their transcript. So this is actually a benefit to students because if you see in the current trends, because we have done some um, uh, surveys as well to look at uh, what actually uh, the students work, you know, after they graduate. Some of the students, I think about 40% of our students, they are not working under their own uh, field of study. And what interesting is that some graduates actually working under their minor or just one course from what they have actually learned during their studies in university. So that portray that we need to give more uh, flexibility in terms of the courses, in terms of the choices that the students can actually select during their studies. Because what important here is that the learning experience in campus so it's not only on academic, but also on co-curricular. So we encourage if the student want to do more electives, I mean, beyond their fulfillment, they can do so. Okay, so that's how uh, the elective packages will work in the near future. I really hope that this will be, will be uh, becoming, you know, a preferred uh, curriculum in future that the students, you know, would like to have and also the academics giving the opportunity for the students to venture into another cross-discipline areas. 
So they are not only focusing at their own PTG or jabatan or department level, but they can also uh, uh, get some knowledge beyond their major disciplines. So I hope that it gives some uh, uh, input, you know, to the academics. Uh, I think we we more openness. I mean, this is one of the, our points. Uh, open, okay, uh, openness, even though in terms of academic as well on on this and these issues. Uh, I agree, Prof. Um, and I I can I can foresee that um, uh, having like a major and minor would improve uh, our students' employ employability, isn't it? Because <laughs> they are they uh, graduate with a diverse skill set that may, many like, really, really focused uh, programs will not have. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the uh, the next question. Uh, Dr. Amira uh, put something in chat with the minor package. Okay, <laughs> okay sorry uh, Dr. Amira because uh, this, uh, we are going to start with our new coming students uh, because with the new curriculum uh, after the uh, review curriculum exercise. So uh, this will be for uh, new students in coming session, Dr. Amira. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, moving on to the to the to the next question. Um. Uh. So we we had this uh, two years of of, of pandemic, uh, isn't it? Um. And uh, of course, uh, in uh, not just uh for us, but in even in, in literature, it is uh, uh being mentioned that uh, this is actually a, a silver lining uh for uh, education higher education. So in 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 the context of UM. What is the biggest potential that we can tap uh, as our sort of lesson learned um, in our teaching and learning? Uh, and also, how do we then move forward into the future? Okay, I think every one of us have experienced this, all right? Uh, because it's really like a radical transformation at that time, okay? Where we need to convert whatever we have immediately. I mean, uh, during that semester, I remember, and on our part, when I was uh, director of Academic Strategy Plan Center, we have to think about all angles, especially related to our kaidah uh, dan uh, peraturan, you know, that we, we need to give that flexibility to students as well, because we know that it's beyond uh, control. It, it's basically really a radical transformation at that time, okay? But I think what you, your question is be, uh, regarding the biggest potential that we can tap, definitely, if you look at here, we we being uh, given not given lah. It's actually a, a, a task, you know, to make sure a flexibility in teaching and learning. Okay, when you talk about flexibility, teaching and learning experience, then it covers how you deliver your teaching and learning, how you assess the student, uh, especially uh, during that time, you know, through expansion of online and digital provision. Okay, uh, really, you know, expanding online digital provision have really significant adv uh, advantages. Okay, that's where we are now ready to, op to open more, you know, for example, we are going ahead with ODL, which is open distance learning, you know, where they have a higher percentage on, uh, in terms of uh, e-learning uh, platform. Eh? Uh, so, uh, in particular, if you look at it, online learning could enable learners to take more personal responsibility for the learning process. Okay, you have to decide and look at the, what you're going to undertake on this, on this scenario. So when you talk about flexible learning, this actually has shifted the entire focus of education from instructors teaching to the students' learning experience. So every student has a different learning style, but conventional education does not cater to them all. Okay, so therefore, the flexibility of online education is often the most appealing factor in the expansion of online and digital provision into the future. So while I think it promises things like convenience and more freedom, more flexible, positive impacts to the students and overall learning experience. So I think this is, this is the thing that, you know, we have experienced ourselves, you know, they are more creative, more innovative, using a lot of uh, online platform actually the, the 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 what i think is um more more important is um in some way is quite effective learning okay dr zahir okay all right <laughs> yeah i mean um uh um the sort of the, the uh, now i think that the, the the word of the day here is uh, uh, so far is flexibility so flexibility for the the lecturers flexibility for the students isn't it and how do we how do we do how do we cater for that flexibility that we wanted okay so um and uh, i can see that um in some of the ways that we do uh stuff um, um it's it's different than uh than other other 
public universities or even private universities, I would say, uh, when it comes to teaching and learning. So uh, one example is uh, how we like, approach um, uh, MOOC and uh, micro-credential courses. And um, some like other universities, uh, they just instruct lecturers, okay, go and do uh, and create all these um, uh, online courses, MOOC and micro-credential, but they don't s- sort of uh, support uh, the, the lecturers in uh, having uh, avail- available instructional designers uh, to help with the development. And also, we also promise uh, like reduce the te- teaching time and also a, a revenue share model. So why uh, are we taking a different uh, way uh, in, in this matter? And how do you see, foresee the growth of online courses? Uh, probably as a, uh, the way that we uh, uh, sort of democratize education and also at the same time, uh, generate income for the university. Okay, um, okay. Before this, to say, uh, UM as a premier and old university, we use uh, we used to offer only what we call it conventional academic program. Okay, uh, uh, there are two methods of delivery. Basically, if you're talking about academic program, one we call it conventional. The other one we call it. Uh, uh, ODL, which is Open Distance Learning. Okay, so uh, we are mostly practicing only conventional programs. So basically, under conventional program, just to share with others, under conventional program, uh, uh, there are two kinds of delivery approach. One is face to face. The other one is uh, we call it remote learning. Okay, it's still under conventional program. Uh, during pandemic, we move our courses to all remote learning because the students were not in campus. Okay, we plan to again before we move to what we call it ODL, which is hundred percent program under ODL. Uh, the transition period will be still continuing the remote learning because we still having students abroad elsewhere who could not come and join us in campus. Okay. So uh, that's that's the main um, uh, model that we, we we approach. Okay. Besides that, okay, there are a, a quite numbers of um, uh, um, courses. The categorization of courses, as you said, lah, they have more. They have micro credentials. They have a uh, normal online courses and others. All right. Where uh, for more and micro credential, particularly. Uh, uh, we need to have a proper platform, okay? Uh, the proper platform, which uh, they have uh, one, definitely quality, okay? Second, normally when we join any courses, okay, through MOOC or micro credential, we would like to have certificate, all right? So, what UM did at that time, I think you and, your, and I think Dr. Zahir and the team, you know, I, I mean, uh, we have to acknowledge them working very hard to find the best platform to move forward. Dr. Zahi and team, Dr. Farah and Dr. Amira and the team. I mean, they try to find a platform, you know, the good platform that can actually, uh, we can we can offer a, a quality of uh, MOOC and micro-credential courses, okay? Uh, that's why sometimes uh, in, in the development of this kind of courses, you know, it will take some time because we need to achieve certain level of quality, okay? Um, so we are not like, simply moving to that area you know to offer more and micro credential because uh, as we know okay we need to have uh, 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 courses or modules that at high quality okay besides that you know i think all our academics are moving ahead with uh, remote learning uh, uh, kind of uh, activities at the same time okay in short while in future what i would like to see that all online courses can can be you know can be uh, transformed in a modular fashion maybe in a micro credential courses because as we know okay um are going ahead with uh, what we call it degree stacking you know we can collect the uh, credentials from different platform for example from more micro credential and so on so that in future they can actually have a certain degrees. I mean, the students uh, actually have that opportunity to stack their credentials. At the end, it can be transferred and to get a qualification. So that's the that's the target. Okay, preparation. Okay, the preparation definitely is really challenging because we need to have a cyber infrastructure to support. 
Okay, the flow and process information, learning platform, host online courses, online video conferencing, collaborative learning, live streaming. Um, uh, and then maybe you can also uh, uh, do your own uh, teaching learning platform, definitely to provide synchronous and asynchronous type of e-learning. I think that's a creative and innovative approach that I think uh, uh, most of our academics have done it, you know, have experienced it before. But to say it, you know, to be prepared, especially when you talk about ID, the instructional designer, I think uh, we know that, you know, uh, definitely we are, really focus on ADEC to give that training, to give that uh, support and development process to the academics to come up with the uh, courses, what we call it micro-credential or more, or even other online courses. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I think we have quite a number of uh, MOOC and micro-credential course offered online, but still we really need, you know, uh, instructional designer to help the academics. I have actually what I can do at my end, okay, I've select uh, uh, a few academics who can contribute to this MOOC and also my credential courses. I put them, you know, as in their KPI. So then because why? Because I think moving forward for UM direction and UM KPI this year, we have that we have to produce quite a number of MOOC and micro credentials. So uh, then, unfortunate lah. But I think uh, 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 with with the conversation that I have with the lecturer, they 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 welcome all this kind of uh, approach in future. So it means they are willing to uh, to help and to develop more uh, MOOC and micro credential courses. So I hope that uh, they can work together with uh, Dr. Zahir and team, uh, Dr. Farah, and all our uh, ID, okay, and IDAC to come up with uh, more uh, MOOC and micro-credential courses in the future. Uh, but I think besides that, uh, Dr. Zahir, uh, we have our platform, you know, uh, uh, our main technology innovation uh, that you am use now is Spectrum, isn't it? Uh, hopefully, uh, you know what the stands is for student powered e collaborative transforming UM okay, under that. So, uh, this infrastructure, I think, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, keep on uh, training and training staff to, to make sure that uh, all this, uh, uh, whatever built under spectrum, can be used and actively used in our teaching and learning. And besides that, I think there are quite a number of uh, training by EDEC as well on the on the um, uh, uh, teaching and learning activities for e-learning, lah. I think under, under your portfolio, Dr. Zahir, I believe that uh, uh, some academic or most of academics have actually joined in into the training as well. So through all these initiatives, uh, I see uh, significant growth on online courses in the coming years. Okay, and I think they will foster diversity and inclusivity uh, by applying knowledge to a more engaging learning environment to develop independent learners involved in their learning journey. So I think hopefully as, as an academic, we have to give that a platform and also a way uh, forward on this kind of activities. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, of course, to, to, to echo uh, what um, uh, Prof Yatima has said uh, with regard to Spectrum, uh, we have um, all, uh, this year uh, almost uh, like 150, 160 training uh, sessions uh, 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 scheduled. And of course, uh, everybody is uh, uh, welcome uh, to join. We do a range of um, uh, teaching and learning, especially uh, e-learning, especially uh, uh, training uh, and help uh, for uh, our uh, uh, fellow lecturers then you can actually uh, make full use of um, the activities and also the, the, the learning um, modules that you can have in Spectrum. And uh, we believe that this will help uh, you to uh, be able to prepare yourself to offer online courses in the future because uh, the, the transition from, uh, I would say, uh, doing things in Spectrum to doing things in uh, an online course is not that far off so the jump is not far off so uh, once you are sort of adept uh, in uh, doing the uh, stuff in uh, our spectrum then uh, it's easier for you to transition uh, into doing uh, things into an online course and I, I would i would say that um, uh, having 
being put um, the development of uh, online courses in in their KPI is is not really uh, unfortunate. I, th- I think it's very po- it's very fortunate because um, there is a, a lot of potential that that those academics uh, can actually gain uh, from that. So we have seen um, like uh, many fold of um, uh, increase in learner uh, numbers going into our, our platform, and I, I can uh, uh, sort of uh, be proud that um, uh, UM. As a university, uh, compared to other UA, we have the most um, learners, international learners that goes into our um, uh, online courses, MOOC and, and micro credential, and and that, that is something that we we uh, we can be proud of uh, because uh, with the uh, number of courses that we have, um, we I think uh, the last figure I saw is actually about twenty thousand um, or two hundred thousand uh, learners. Uh, maybe t- maybe t- 20,000 30,000 learners that goes through our our e-learning platform and that is sort of uh, uh, trumps like three or four uh, maybe uh, 10 other p- public universities who also offered uh, uh, online courses and they don't have the, the, that kind of international numbers as, as we do so uh, and that is uh, all I think um, uh, due to the uh, the the draw and also the the, the brand of uh, of um and we are representing that uh, that brand okay so um i think uh, that um, I, agree, I agree with you dr zahid you know what uh, what uh, i think we have also introduced not only uh, remote learning in terms of a common uh, courses or coursework that we are doing we are also now introducing remote supervision okay I think that's also a new approach that UM will be doing in the near future. We have started, uh, a few of our students uh, will be under remote supervision. It means that, but not area can do the remote supervision, okay? We do understand in certain area, we can't. We need them to come to UM. But in certain areas, yes, they can do it. So we are introducing a remote supervision at the same time, okay? Uh, uh, where, Where our students can be at their home uh, whatever home place, all right, um, and uh, the supervision will be done remotely or online. Okay, but again, uh, I will emphasize that it is not uh, for all discipline. In certain discipline, yes. So, like before, we want them to come at least a year in in Malaysia, but now no longer. So we can allow them to stay at their own place. Uh, but again, uh, it has to be. Uh, uh, online uh, supervisions and activities uh, we undergo the same uh, um, way that we are doing as online teaching and learning coursework. Okay. Okay. Again, and, and again, uh, the, the keyword here is flexibility, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I mean, we have to we have to jive. I mean, we have to go ahead with that. This is what uh, people are, you know, acquiring out there as well. Uh, they want to be more flexible. They want to be at home and do their part, and you know, at the same time doing a lot of things, you know. But again, uh, we cannot say that it's hundred percent effective. Okay, uh, as an academic, I believe that we used to to hold pen, you know, to hold things, you know, to to we like to see them. Uh, in front of us, you know, do teaching, you know, a, a, a conventional way. Uh, we still have that uh, passion, you know, I myself, because I think I'm old enough, so I have that passion to teach in front of the uh, whiteboard, you know. But again, uh, that's why I would like students to come back to campus to have that, again, learning experience. But again, no doubt, in some area, they can do um, 100% online. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, um, uh, so I think... Uh, yeah, uh, that is um, okay. So we have a question from uh, Dr. Amira. Dr. Amira, do, do you want to uh, open your mic and ask your question? Uh, okay. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah. I can uh, my apologies. I think I have a bit of a mic problem, but uh, oh yeah, I think it's working now. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, Prof. I wanted to just to just to reconfirm that. The uh, 12 months residency requirement for international students, like what Prof said just now, that it's not required anymore. Is this also applicable to students who have actually registered or started their candidacy before 2020? Or is it only for students from 2020 onwards? I believe the students before 2020 have actually come, came to Malaysia. All right. They have actually 
uh, went through our research methodology course and they, uh, they have actually went through uh, in, in some experience in campus, I believe so. I'm not sure whether in some cases they, they didn't have that opportunity because last two years we have pandemic, but they, there is no requirement anymore, okay? Uh, uh, MQA basically have lifted, lifted that, so, so do U, UM. All right, so that's why I said they don't have to have fulfill the residency requirement uh, in order for them to, to graduate. So means uh, it's no longer. I think there are questions before that. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Ong Zi Chin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Doc, Dr. Ong. Uh, would you like to uh, ask your questions directly to, to Prof? Yes, Prof. Uh, just now I heard about this. Uh, 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 what our minor package, uh, which I, I think is very good, you know, that is the future. We should not stand in one discipline alone. But I, I just want to ask whether, is there any future preparing for double degree? So, because uh, uh, the university nowadays, they, they cross discipline, they actually prepare like, uh, it's like full year degree, maybe they have five years and they have double degrees and things like that, right? So, actually, are we looking up for that? Okay. May I know, Dr. Ong, which faculty are you coming from? Uh, faculty of Law. Oh, faculty of Law. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ong. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in, our, in our plan on the flexible curriculum, we are not only focusing on minor electives, but we also are looking forward for major electives and double degree program. Okay. Uh, why... Uh, um, uh, in, in our pipeline, okay, because we need to also prepare on the system development, okay, on, on the system and Maya itself. So we need to have that uh, to be in place in order for, for us to start offering that kind of program. But yes, for future, inshallah, I think when coming, coming after we have started the minor elective, we're going to start on the major elective. It means that they can do a double major, all right? And the next uh, level is on double degree. Just to state, we have uh, our two programs, double degree program under FBL already in place. Okay. And uh, this year, I think there will be another uh, double degree program from FPE, a uh, business and economic. That one is under MBA program. So we have to date two approved by KPT and one is uh, ongoing. But uh, inshallah, in future, definitely, you know, we want to get hit for more uh, flexible kind of uh, degree. But again, I, I will state here, uh, the one that worries us is on the MQA because, um, as you know, when we get approval uh, uh, to get this accreditation, uh, we need to apply on the degree uh, per se, you know. When we give the flexibility to students, we must make sure that we follow the degree that approve and accredited by MQA. We cannot simply add on in the name, the name of the program. We cannot just say, for example, we uh, Bachelor of <clears throat> Bachelor of Science, <clears throat> sorry, Bachelor of Science Chemistry with Entrepreneurship, for example. We don't have that kind of program, so we cannot offer. So we, we can't go to that extent of flexibility at the moment because we are tied with MQA requirements. Okay, uh, yes, I think we for... already have uh, things like um, double PhD, isn't it? Uh, already yeah, in place. Yeah, dual PhD, yeah. Uh, dual PhD, yeah, dual PhD. So, so now we are moving uh, to the to the undergraduate level where we can actually offer uh, double degree. I think, yeah, that, uh, that is uh, exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, um, we have another question from, uh, this one is from Dr. Azah. Dr. Azah, would you like to ask your question? <coughs> Thank you, Prof. <clears throat> Assalamualaikum. Uh, Azah here. Um, you talk about flexibility. I'm, I'm so excited about all the potential um, directions that we can head into. Um, I'm just uh, curious about um, um, in terms of the needs analysis, in terms of the assessment, how, how much or what has been done from the DVC AI office, your office, with the other offices like student affairs or research, like for example, the students are able to demonstrate their skills or whatever under the different offices. Is that is that something that um, is possible or you're thinking about? You mean, is that uh, students, uh, allowing the students to do like short intern in, in that portfolio? Um, it can be anything like short intern or let's say they have... Uh, let, no, let me, let me, uh, let me share with you, okay? The... Um, the uh, transformation uh, program exercise by Ministry of Higher Education. 
unfortunate I was leading that that framework as well. Uh, uh, all right, so we we have actually published uh, the uh, playbook. Okay, end of last year. Uh, about the Excel framework. This is experiential learning and computer competency-based landscape. Uh, this is a, the transformation that the KPT would like all you is uh, to emphasize on these uh, four types of um, uh, framework. One, they call it real, which is more research-based, uh, uh, ideal, which is industry, uh, poise, which is personalized curriculum, and care is a community. If you look into that, all right, these are what I think uh, transpires, I think what you're talking about. For example, for example, in that framework, we have given uh, examples of curriculum structure where uh, in, in certain levels, uh, we can actually uh, um, uh, develop and come up with uh, the curriculum under that particular framework. For example, research, real, okay? They have different level of uh, research emphasized. They will emphasize different level of research activities. Uh, as what we have been doing in, in our programs, for example, we have FYP, yeah, final year project. This final year project covers only stage one to stage three, for example, in a real framework, where students can only producing a report. What we want at the end, students can be a mentor to do research. Okay, so if the, the program is focusing on a real framework, a, a quite number of uh, credits will be emphasized on research activities. Okay, it means that the students uh, not only you know, doing a coursework, but the emphasis will be more on research activities. So they have to come up with maybe a product or prototype. Okay, so the, the objective with that framework is a bit flexible. Okay, it's not that we have to do 70% coursework, 30% only research and so on. So they have to follow uh, that pathway in order for them uh, to be um, under that uh, real framework. And uh, for example, in community as well, okay, we have care, community. Uh, in care, uh, currently we are doing like a uh, uh, community engagement course, we are doing uh, SULAM, okay, but it's it's only taken up two to four credits, all right? It's only surface. It's only just a, an activity, okay? But for care, what we want here is more sustainable engagement with community. I mean, they start the community engagement during their first year. They have projects with community and they have to follow through the projects and make the projects sustain until they are graduates. So it means that the community engagement embedded from the beginning of their studies. Okay, so for example, in your, uh, uh, in, in your questions, you're asking whether the students have a chance to do this kind of activities, okay? Either internship under the management portfolio or doing research with other uh, uh, stakeholders or partners. Yes, with this framework, they're giving more flexi flexibility in terms of designing their curriculum. Okay, so I hope in the near future for the coming exercise under a curriculum review and also new academic program, they have to fall under any one of the category so that we know the direction of that academic program. So, so I hope that is answers some of the questions as well on that flexibility. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Yes. Uh. Yeah. That, that's that's interesting. So. Um. I think. Um. Uh, the the burning question. Uh. From that is. Uh. Will. Uh. Um. Adopt all of the. Uh. The framework that's. Uh. That's being done. Uh. At the KPT level. The real ideal poise and and care. And how do we plan to customize it? Prob probably in our in our in our university. And uh. When will sort of this start? Okay. Uh. KPT have uh identified university layer. One, uh, every university have their strength. My university, I received a letter from KPT yesterday. Uh, we need to uh, propose one program under the category of POIS, which is personalized curriculum. This is very challenging eh, because we don't have any of this kind of uh, framework before. Okay, actually I had a, a earlier discussion with uh, FBL as well as uh, Sydney Creative Faculty Sydney Creative Arts, okay, uh, to propose, okay, or to change their curriculum towards POIS uh, framework. Why I choose that uh, faculty to venture into this new model is because 
they are uh, focusing more on skills and competency. Okay, for example, in uh, language and linguistic, we are talking about competency, competent in certain languages. It means that they are not only learning in their uh, class, but maybe they will reach community or maybe they have to have experience in certain um, uh, language community. So it means they are venture into more deep into that area. And that, um, and also the skills, you know, skills, uh, for example, in creative arts, you know, maybe they are more into music and so on. They are, what is their passion? Uh, the students can actually build their own uh, degree, you know, based on their passion. All right. So means rather than if they go, uh, they join into the degree which they are not interested in. So might as well they go into the degree that they have the strength and passion in. So we have to design this program in such a way that there must be flexibility. And also maybe we have to consider based on the experience and skills of professional certificate that the students have had before. All right. So means in, in other words, some of the experience or skills that they have can be transferred into some credits, okay, to be recognized that they fulfill, you know, their qualification. So this flexibility has to go very, uh, this is very agile curriculum, you know, as, as to say, uh, then we have to think about how we have to do uh, and how, what are the approach that we need to do? What are the areas also that need to be ventured in? So uh, I really hope that uh, uh, ASPC can can spearhead this and come up with with uh, the curriculum to be offered under POIS model. Yeah, I mean uh, that's uh, interest, interesting stuff. So uh, FBL and also uh, creative uh, creative arts, uh, and it, it it is at program level, isn't it, Prof? Uh, because you have to uh, sort of restructure the the curriculum so that then it meets all the the requirements of of the POIS. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a, a, a question uh, from Dr. Ong again. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ong, uh, so uh, would you like to open your yeah. Uh, mic? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I have uh, another question. So, is it this uh, open up for all faculties? And actually, uh, for, I'm from Faculty of Law. We actually offer Master of uh, Commercial Law, right? Which I think uh, which very much uh, can be related to uh, other faculty, which is faculty of business, economics, and so on, right? So and and our course actually uh, this is a coursework base I mentioned. Uh, so there is no uh, elective subject and all uh, uh, all this you know uh, with other faculty. So I think maybe is it any possibility we can venture into that? Yes, definitely, Dr. Ong. This is what uh, I need from, from all the academics to have uh, to venture into more cross-discipline area. I believe that, you know, this um, motivation, you know, uh, it, it is not new to say, but it's not being implemented yet. So what I want you to uh, definitely, you know, if you would like to have uh, elective from other uh, faculty, okay, um, you can have... You can, you can basically have a short discussion if the Faculty of Business and Economics have certain courses that can be offered under your electives, by all means. Because every courses have their own uh, uh, course name and course code, all right? If they agree to offer under your program, you can start that immediately. It's no problem, but you have to go through the uh, approval process, eh? Because we need to put in the uh, elective courses under your own diet or what they call it, uh, uh, your own uh, curriculum for that particular course. So I need to uh, speak, first I need to speak to the uh, Faculty of uh, Business and Economics. Uh, I, I, because we have uh, like competition law, I think uh, the students sometimes they don't, they need a certain economics background to actually understand how it works. You know, I think that is a, a subject that we can definitely cross. Right and and commercial law when we're talking about commercial law in business activity and all these things faculty of business is the one I'm talking some of the uh, courses is definitely will be very much helpful, right? So 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 first I think we I mean I need to speak to uh, uh, the other faculty and say is it possible for them to offer their subject as our elective? Yeah. Exactly exactly we have to work together. I think nowadays we can't just uh, stay yeah. in our own discipline you know as well as again not only teaching but also research. We are encouraging more multi and transdisciplinary uh, kind of uh, uh, activities. Yes, thank you, thank you, Prof. 
sorry okay so i mean um when you when you look at the the how we are moving things it's actually uh, on the students perspective it's actually a value add isn't it uh, for them because they they get uh, all this a uh, different uh, perspective from uh, from uh, Dr Ong just now uh, uh, although uh, you are doing a master in law but then uh, you also get the perspective of people from from business and economics so yeah i mean uh, that is something that uh, can like, bring more value to uh, our students okay so i, I think uh, uh, please keep the questions uh, come uh, coming um, and yeah there's one question uh, just pop up just now um Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Visha. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, morning, Prof. Okay, I'm I'm always looking at at the other end, which are students, and um, based on my experience teaching international as well as local, I realize that they also have a lot of potential. But because we always frame it as if like we know the best and they have to follow, uh, sometimes there's a mismatch. So uh, my question is, do we think out of the box and do we give voices to the students to create a platform where they can say, hey, this is what we actually need based on, you know, whether digital or post-endemic. So do we have a platform or do we have a space for them to come out with ideas and we can merge it with what we have as our vision and mission? That's my question. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Visha. Okay. I think, um, okay. What? The main, the main, um, uh, okay, in, in, in academic, in academic matters or other matters, you know, the closest is actually the students and the academics, all right? The next step is definitely, I know that they have to talk to the deans, all right? Because besides uh, having uh, that discussion uh, uh, among the lecturers and the students, the next step is actually the dean who knows the direction and also, uh, Uh, you know, uh, uh, the activities under their uh, faculty, all right. So what I can say here, okay, um, uh, normally when, when the students, even local or international, uh, uh, when they, uh, when we do like, when, okay, for example, I just give an example, when you do a curriculum review, okay, And over the years, I've uh, seen, you know, in the document of curriculum review, we still lack of the um, the true, what they call it, the true surveys made by the PTJs to get input from students, okay? Um, uh, they did the surveys, but I could not see the impact to make some changes, all right? For, for example, you know, as you said, maybe students want to voice about you know not uh, happy or not uh, satisfied with the course content okay we we know that we have c test you know that the students can voice you know that's the the first platform but again you know when we do a survey because this every every cycle we we need to do a curriculum review where we want to get more input from the stakeholders actually the main stakeholders that we're talking about is our students because they are now ongoing you know in, ongoing with us and they are actually receiving the knowledge from us so this kind of activities is not really happen you know when i when i ask about the service uh, output you know i could not see the impact you know for them because uh, they should actually hear their voice and 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 look for improvements okay so This is about that because you know why? Because we we are preparing the curriculum for our future graduates. The graduates will be working in the real world. So we must make sure that it is actually, you know, at, at least, you know, on our curriculum can bridge the gap. You know, students need the skills, students need the knowledge to be prepared for the future jobs. Uh, so so in, in, in certain programs, what I heard from the students when we had the interview, you know, separate, I had interview session with the students and also the external accessors separately. Uh, I can hear that, you know, the external accessors uh, told us that, you know, that there is some uh, activities uh, or input from the students which is not taken into account when we review the curriculum of the program. So, but then again, uh, when when uh, when we look into that carefully, yes, sometimes the 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 command and the input from the students is not really uh, taking into action. Okay, 
Okay, that's the one platform that we're doing. Normally, we're doing surveys, okay? And on the other one that I said earlier is actually the C-test. That's why the C-test sometimes, you know, is, is need to be uh, uh, seriously uh, look into that, you know, especially on the cost content. On the other hand, for, for, the, for the future career, okay, for the future career, for example, students need some advice because, of course, they come to university at the end, they want to have a good career, okay? Uh, uh, what I understand, because uh, in ACP, uh, we have um, uh, 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 a person who actually uh, in charge on this uh, career, uh, career advising career for future careers, okay? I'm not sure about the, the exact name, uh, because uh, this engagement with uh, uh, industries and also uh, making sure that the graduate employability is taken care by HEP. So what I would suggest, you know, as, as we are all in PTJs, now every PTJs have TDHEP. It's a new portfolio, okay? So TDHEP must play a role in, in, in hearing all these comments from students, even local or international. Because I think why they come to UM, why they come to university, because they want to they wanna have a job in future. Nobody wants to just study, you know, they want to have a job in future, a good job, a good placement and so on. So I think the guide, the uh, skills needed, because it used to be last time we have what we call it um, uh, a graduating skills program, something like that. I'm, I, can't, I can't remember, you know, we have like a one skills training where students can have the skills how to write CV, you know. I think they're still ongoing. HCP are conducting uh, some courses or some exposures to students as well to get them, you know, uh, in, in the job market in future. So I think uh, we can get more information on the uh, faculty and HCP on this part. Uh, I hope that, you know, the TD HCP will play a big role in making sure that uh, the students, you know, preparing the students for real job market in future. So they, and also their welfare as well. Uh, because uh, that's the main uh, task of the uh, TD HCP is what I understand, Dr. Bisha. Okay. Thank you, bro. Um, okay, so I, I think one one other thing that I can remember uh, when we get students in Pujaji PISA, when we, when we do PISA, so PISA also we have to uh, do the, the, the survey. Okay, so um, uh, let's move down, let's move on to uh, our, um, uh, the, the latest in our uh, diet uh, in Shimai, which is ODL. Uh, because uh, we know that ODL is, is coming uh, quite soon, isn't it? Uh, it's, uh, so based on your uh, conversation with uh, different parties uh, uh, where we wanted to sort of uh, now uh, really get on the ground and offer our first uh, ODL program after so long. I, I remember UM have ODL program in the 80s. Uh, somebody told me uh, we have uh, ODL program in the 80s. So... Uh, so my, my question is, how ready are we uh, to successfully offer this uh, ODL again uh, in, 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 in the context of the new future? <laughs> okay, thank you, right. Okay, uh, I think we have talked about ODL since three years back. I think I, I remember that was time when uh, our DBCA was uh, Dato' Awang, okay? Uh, really pushed on ODL at that time, I think more than four years, I think. Uh, really, we have actually working together with uh, because UMC set is um, is the one that being appointed, you know, to handle all, all ODL programs. Okay, so uh, definitely there are massive challenges. Okay, because it's the basic new. Even though we have done it, I think twenty years ago, all right. But the, this this time around is different because we have the MQA requirements. Okay, we have. Uh, uh, ODL, you know, uh, the um, accreditation requirement for ODL, okay, which is quite uh, straight from MQA. That's why I said, I mean, every program can only have two choices of uh, delivery method. One is conventional, one is ODL. So the ODL, what's what's have in ODL is that the most challenging is the preparation of SIP, the self-instructional materials, okay? So over the years, actually, we are trying to get, of course, uh, ID, instructional designer, to make sure that the ODL SIM package is fulfilled. Um, and then uh, the other challenges is actually preparation of documentation. Because once we have to have accreditation and also approval from KPT as well as MQA, that's where the, the documentation needed. 
Okay, so preparation documentation definitely inside there we need to have the uh, surveys and why is it important to move to ODL and so on. And then we also have to apply for the provisional accreditation and we need to have an external panel assessors as well. That's took up quite a long journey, all right. And QMAC, ADEC and also uh, UMC set are really working hard to make sure that the documentation in place. And finally, to the Secretariat of JKIK is ASBC. Uh, so I think what I can, I can, I can cherish by today is we managed to have first ODL program approved by Senate uh, just recently, okay, last week, uh, Masters of Safety, Health and Environment uh, in Faculty, uh, Faculty of Engineering. So very recent. So the first ODL after four years, you know, uh, of... of uh, uh, planning and also a lot of activity but inshallah coming soon in a pipeline we have four more in the pipelines for this year and hopefully for coming years will be more and more because since we have that experience we, we, we have actually went through all this process you know to say for ODL so um, uh, yes because uh, UM as, as we know because it's not easy for us to move from one state to the other state okay not like a private university they're very fast in that uh, and we also constrain in terms of, uh, as I said, lah, preparation of the SIM, the same eh, self instructional materials. So I really hope that uh, moving forward, we are giving more opportunities and uh, uh, faster development stage, I believe, uh, on, on this ODL program. <laughs> Uh, okay, Prof. So again, the, the key word here is actually flexibility. And moving, moving on to, 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 to my last question, again, about flexibility uh, in, in learning and also uh, offering our curriculum is on our remote learning and also cost buffet. So, uh, and particularly is, is the cost buffet because uh, we, we can see that uh, there is great potential in, in, in cost buffet uh, to have uh, people uh, from all walks of life, uh, from pub from the public to get, go in into the university and also then uh, study or uh, sit into one or pr a program or uh, two or three courses within the program, so and then get their get knowledge from uh, our uh, our university lecturers and that I think uh, in in itself is actually a good networking process for the lecturers themselves and also good networking uh, process for our students who have the opportunity to sort of connect with people from the outside uh, who might be uh, their collaborators in the future, isn't it? Uh, and, and build business together. So uh, how do we make this mode of study sustainable? Because this, uh, to me, I think it's, it's a new innovation and I haven't seen it anywhere in the, in the country. So uh, my question is, uh, have we uh, seen this cost buffet model elsewhere before, and uh, if so, how how successful were the uh, were they? Okay, all right. Uh, I think we have heard uh, along the way. Uh, I'm I'm not sure whether uh, anyone of you heard about it about shared courses, uh, about buff uh, cost buffet. You know, buffet. I mean, choices of courses. Uh, same kind of activities have actually. Um, um, being practiced elsewhere. I've, I've heard in some countries, you know, they're doing it. Uh, again, this relates to a lifelong learning, all right, where, you know, we have people that would like to um, strengthen their skills, their knowledge, you know, would like to join in, especially people from uh, working, working people outside, all right. Uh, now, UM, we open a border to offer what we call it cost buffet. Okay, shared courses, we also have shared courses under the project of scale. The concept, the philosophy are the same, all right? The only thing that for shared courses under scale project is for other UAs, only for UAs, all right? Where we can share a teaching the course or maybe cross, you know, we can take UKM courses and UM, uh, UKM can take UM courses. This is more on the uh, undergraduate students, all right? But for cost buffet approach is different. It's open to all, even to students or to working people, people outside who would like to join in any courses. So the cost buffet, the scale is under GEMC, which is under the Mobility Center. But cost buffet is under UMC set because UMC set is lifelong learning center. So then uh, UMC set, the cost buffet is part under UMC set. 
Okay, the cost buffet is offered. Why we call it buffet? Definitely, we have choices of courses. Okay. Uh, we have started, I think this is our second semester offering cost buffet. Okay. Again, uh, the numbers is real is not that you know a massive, but again, uh, it started growing. And hopefully by offering more courses, and uh, we have we can have more students. What important here to highlight is that for a cost buffet, uh, we would actually our 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 aim is to offer more professional and certification courses. All right, it means that uh, because we know that uh, working people they have some knowledge, but they want the professional. Uh, training. They want the uh, professional skills and they want a certified program, for example. So uh, then they don't have to do a degree for them to get that knowledge. You know, if they do a degree, it might take longer period. Uh, so I think this is also the same concept as MOOC and micro credentials. I mean, they can take online courses through our future learning platform. But for this, it's directly they can have like face-to-face -face, uh, learning experience. So today, what we have, we are offering some courses uh, in uh, a few of the faculty, for example, data analytics from FSKTM, okay? And then uh, some courses under economics, uh, which is very limited. But what we want to, uh, want, we want to have is more courses that can be offered under cost buffet. To talk about sustainability, I think this one is also need... Uh, uh, people's effort, the faculty, the PTJs who are actually the experts in the field to offer more, uh, what I call it, professional certification program. Okay, uh, then at the same time, we can have the income generation. There is a model how uh, uh, faculty can gain income from this cost buffet. The cost buffet might not take the whole semester. Currently, we're offering whatever we have in every semester. That's why it takes like one semester course. But what I would like to see in the future is not that. It's a short course. It's maybe a crash course. It's maybe just, you know, a few days, you know, taking, taking, taking over that the whole uh, syllabus, uh, the, the whole part, the whole content. Uh, it depends on how uh, faculty can design it. Definitely, UMC set don't have that. Uh, uh, much expertise in certain area. That's why we want the faculty to actually come up with a professional program, you know, that can, can park under the cost buffet. And definitely the target market is the working people because they have money. They only want to have some skills, you know, a short-term skills. And you can have it during weekend or other, other days that you can have a short period of time. So that is what actually the cost buffet uh, uh uh, expires, you know, uh, the expiration of it. But yes, definitely we just started. So we need to have more active participations from the PTG. Okay, so I, I, I actually uh, offered my, my course, uh, Health and Safety as a course buffet for, for next semester. How's it, How is it Dr. Zai? Huh? How is it? Uh, yeah, I, I'm offering it uh, for, for the first time next semester. I see, I see. Uh, right. So, yeah, but, but I can see now actually the, the, the potential is actually um, uh, much bigger than just uh, people coming in into my classroom, isn't it? Because uh, uh, you said just now, uh, because health and safety is something that's uh, quite, uh, it is regulated in, 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 the, in, in, in Malaysia. So, uh, we have CIDB certification and so we have uh, NIOS certific certification. So, now I'm thinking that maybe I should uh, go and talk to a CIDB and also to NIOS and see whether uh, the, 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 the buffet people uh, or uh, people who are coming for, for the cost buffet can actually get some sort of certification out of the cost buffet that I offer in health and safety. Yeah, I think I think that is, uh, yeah, I think that is uh, something that uh, have to be designed, I think, uh, and also have to be collaborated with uh, all these professional bodies. So, and one more thing that I can see is actually uh, with the professional bodies uh, for CPD, uh, isn't it? So, that also can also uh, be uh, sort of packed into the uh, cost buffet um, uh, yes. method. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what we we should target because, uh, and 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 this is where we can engage ourselves with industry. We're talking about academic industry, academia industry, uh, but what we we are just in campus, you know. By having this course buffet and the students coming in from all over, you know, stakeholders, different stakeholders, industry, and we can exchange knowledge. We can capitalize our experts, you know, and then uh, we can also have this uh, networking. Because they are basically adults learners and we are adults as well. I think exchanging ideas, you know, 
uh, more interactive session. I think that would be great. And at the end of the day, of course, a win-win situation because we promise, I mean, what, what have been promised that you can get some of the portions, you know, because if because we they pay, it's not a normal pay, it'll be a different rate, okay? And then at the same time, the faculty or the, the individual itself can actually have some income on, on that particular program. So I think uh, UMCSAT has really had to play a role and do a lot of engagement with PTJs to, to, to state that this is the uh, way forward for the cost buffet uh, uh, program. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. So actually that uh, brings uh, the end to, to the, the set of questions that, uh, that uh, EDEC have. So now we uh, would like to open the session to all the uh, participants uh, here. Uh, so we have uh, now uh, 86 uh, participants. So if you have um, uh, any questions with regard to uh, teaching and learning, with regards to the, the, the matters of uh, uh, under TNCA uh, portfolio, uh, Prof. Yatima, uh, if you would uh, like to ask your, your questions, uh, I would suggest that uh, you open uh, your mic and I also, sorry, let's, so, so that we have a bit of order, uh, you raise your hand first uh, using the reaction button and then uh, I will call you up and then you can open your mic uh, if you have any questions. All right, so anyone wants to uh, start the, the sort of the quick fire round? <laughs> Uh, may, may I ask a question? Yep. Okay, yeah, the, uh, go ahead, Dr. Amira. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. Um, now, uh, just something came to mind, I was wondering, because we, we do talk a lot about, um, we do talk a lot about uh, preparing our undergrads, especially for future jobs, and, you know, uh, giving them the profession development, and also, like, um, offering them courses that will probably expand their job opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities once they finish and they graduate from UM. Um, I was just also wondering, um, for our postgrad students, especially for our um, PhD students, I think many of the PhD students are actually looking for careers in academia once they graduate. So would it be possible if we could perhaps, um, you know, provide some at that value added opportunities for postgrad students by maybe um, allowing them or mentoring them to teach with us on an official capacity like a teaching assistant uh, or allowing them to uh, teach some you know um, undergrad courses or co-teach uh, some undergrad courses uh, or even some you know uh, master's courses if they are PhD students uh, and this can possibly be an additional, um, I guess, like diet tarikan, although we probably have like too many students already applying to UM, but it could be an added value for them, especially for students from overseas, um, having on their CV that they had teaching experience in UM could be very, very valuable for them. So I was just wondering if this could be something that we could try to, um, to explore. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amira. Uh, basically, we have the teaching assistant schemes, all right? But this is more on our, our, our current ongoing students, all right? So we do encourage them to do uh, teaching, all right? And we pay a small portion of uh, assistantship like, in terms of that. But we are talking about our, our graduates, you know, PhD graduates, you know, uh, who have actually graduated. Uh, uh, the uh, teaching assistantship, uh, I think, is under the purview of the deans of the faculty. They can actually appoint them as a teaching assistant because we have what we call it the uh, part-timers, teaching part-timers. So instead of, uh, uh, the, under the same category, actually, part-timers. So the part-timers can be our own uh, graduate students. I mean, the selections of the uh, um, uh, uh, the part-timers, I think that one is done under the faculty. On the other hand, what you're talking about is at the university level, okay? Recruitment of our new uh, uh, academics, okay? Who have PhD. It's actually now open. It's still open. It's actually opening throughout the year. But again, once uh, uh, we've got the warrant from, from GPA to recruit more uh, new academics, then from that list, we will offer them the place. 
I've been interviewing quite often, actually since I sit in the position, almost every two weeks, I will interview half a day, half a day or the whole day, uh, a new academic staff. So there's still ongoing recruitment of staff, okay, uh, for the academics. But what I said, I mean, they also have the opportunity to do postdoctoral uh, uh, here in, in UM, but this is under portfolio of uh, research and innovation. Oh, okay, Th thanks, Prof. Uh, I actually, I, I was also wondering if it might be possible to have sort of like um, a mentorship program, a teaching, a TNL mentorship program for our PhD students, the current students, the ones who are not graduated yet, so that they can teach along with their supervisor mm -hmm. and that well, mentorship program. And that is taking. I, I remember that that have actually proposed that kind of training before. Uh. Not for uh, postgrad students because ADEC looks after the uh, looks after we, we look after training for um, oh. academic staff, not not for students. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll see how I can do on on that part. Okay, we we'll see how we can plan on that. I do understand that, but most of the training is actually handled by ADEC. So anything about teaching and learning is handled by ADEC. So uh, the, 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 the type of partic participants, I think that one can be expanded, okay? I do understand that, you know, uh, ADEC is only focusing for our staff. Uh, but then again, as I said, I mean, that one should not be a problem to introduce like one training program for our graduate students before they're really involved in academic careers. Uh, I, I was actually thinking, Prof, if our students can teach with us, can co-teach with us, uh, with our courses. Like, for example, like many of us have PhD students um, and they're like my, my own PhD students. Sometimes they're asking me, are there any opportunities for them to teach um, a course or to co-teach a course? Because if that can be like um, a way for them to to have some experience teaching at the university level and then having that in their CV would be useful for them when they go out to um, to apply for uh, academic jobs once they've graduated. So the current, uh, I think, teaching um, assistance scheme, uh, I'm not sure if it's open for all faculties and programs. It might be limited, but that scheme is more of actually appointing students, uh, like like I said, just like, like what Prof said just now as part-time, you know, lecturers. But the idea that I was actually uh, thinking about was maybe uh, we can have our own students as our teaching assistants. Uh, and we, as they become our teaching assistants, we also kind of like mentor them how to teach new ways of teaching, how we personally teach. And at the same time, something that they can maybe get, uh, you know, a certificate at the end of it, uh, and something they can put in their CV and say that, oh, I was uh, a teaching assistant at University Malaya for um, this semester, mentored by this particular lecturer. So that, that was kind of like what I was thinking about. Yeah, all right. Is that involve any, uh, any financial assistance? Uh, no, no, uh, I was thinking it's kind of like a value added thing we can offer to any postgrad students. If they are interested to take it on, they can, you know, join as co-teaching and they can get a certificate at the end. Uh, maybe we can put it in their transcript. Um, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, not, not something that we impose on them, but something that some who might be interested, you know, uh, and if their supervisors or if other lecturers uh, are willing to take them on as mentees for teaching and learning, it could be a value added um, thing for them. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mira. I think it's a good idea. We'll see how we can work on it. Uh, because basically, it's just mentoring and coaching, you know. So uh, it's more on the voluntarily uh, kind of um, activities, isn't it? Between the yes, students yes. as well as the student. I don't see it's a problem. The only thing that uh, need to be um, uh, to be done is actually on the um, uh, you need to sign the confidentiality kind of uh, because it will deals with all the students uh, marks and so on, isn't it? So I think uh, that need to be uh, properly advised on that part lah, because every one of us have actually signed that document. So I think with the teaching assistant, it's not really a teaching assistantship scheme, but this is more on coaching and mentoring uh, future academics. Um, we'll see how it can work on that one. Thank you very much for the idea, Dr. Amira.
Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mira. So, uh, the next uh, hand up is Dr. Evina Alfan. Hi, Dr. Uh, Evina. Assalamualaikum uh, and a very good morning, everyone. Thank you, Prof, for sharing your thoughts and opinion with regards to the uh, online uh, learning education. So, I would just like to um, ask pertaining to the remote learning or the ODL, I'm from the Faculty of Business Economics and Economics, and particularly I'm teaching the Bachelor of Accounting students. Now, uh, for our degree students, they are subjected to various requirements by the professional bodies, right? Um, so, um, it's not that we do not want to take up the uh, remote or the online distance learning route, but the requirements are such that because we are being accredited by the regulators like MIA and also the professional bodies, it's difficult to get the approval on this kind of learning platform. Um, uh, that's one thing. But I do know that um, MIA is doing something about it. And um, just recently, the dean told us that the MIA is having discussion about it. So uh, I do not know what's the uh, outcome of that discussion, but uh, for uh, Bachelor of Accounting, uh, this is something that, you know, is held, uh, holding us back at the moment for the remote or online learning, uh, or online uh, platform learning. Mm -hmm. And the, my other question is uh, pertaining to the current situation right now. I think uh, recently, uh, the World Health Organization um, just uh, stated that um, actually we have not yet even entered the endemic phase. So there is a possibility that there would be uh, an outbreak again for the uh, disease, COVID-19 disease. So I'm just wondering whether uh, from uh, your point of view, whether there are any contingency plan for us because we, we have gone through this before. So if such situation were to occur again, are there some contingency plans maybe to um, assist us and maybe to help speed things up so that it would be uh, easier for everyone? So I would just like to know your opinion regarding this. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Evina. Thank you for the question. Okay, the first one on the professional body. Uh, <clears throat> through our experience, you know, when we had this uh, pandemic, which is uh, last uh, two years, like, almost, eh? um, <clears throat> where we need to switch to online 100% learning. And we, we, we talk and we engage with uh, the professional bodies, I think in your case as well, just to make sure how we're going to move on this because that the professional body requirements. But again, in certain areas, we can't have that approval means they will still want to stay with the accreditation body requirements, okay? So with, with that, I mean, we still uh, agree with whatever decision made because we still have to continue teaching. But again, in a certain discipline, we still need to do face-to-face. -face. I think your discipline in some others, for example, medical dentistry, yes, we need to do physical uh, learning as well. So we just continue whichever programs that require that because that's been stated clearly by the professional bodies. That's why I, I remember that I have about 13 to 14 professional body engagement at that time, just to make sure to move forward, whether we can still do online or we, we still have to do face-to-face. -face. Uh, that's, that's why uh, uh, during that time, I think a few programs has to be um, put on hold, you know, uh, for a short while before we can start again back. Uh, to do a face-to-face -face. but uh, alhamdulillah at that time maybe because it's not that many so we can still handle it so i think in your case you still have to remain whatever the professional body requirement states in their document uh, the, the second option the second question regarding their preparation uh, uh, i personally i think um, uh, um community especially our academics uh, is really fast you know doing the adjustment as I said much earlier in, 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 in my introduction just now, I mean, amazing that we can switch 100% immediately within two weeks, you know, to online learning. And, and uh, I think uh, we are adaptable. 
we are really adaptable in a situation where in this case, uh, I believe that if, if the situation coming in again, you know, uh, I think we can cope with that uh, too, you know. But, but as I said, why uh, I do encourage students to come into campus by week eight is because we want them to get the uh, learning experience in campus, you know, rather than just staying at home and with the family. So uh, uh, that's the motivation why uh, we need them to come back to the campus. But at the same time, I believe all our academics are prepared in any situation. They are really adaptable. I think we don't have that issues. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I think it's a blast that our infra and infrastructures are very much improved from time to time. I think uh, Dr. Zahir 24-7, you know, making sure that the e-learning is, you know, the help desk and the uh, consultation, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that all adult people at that time, really, we need them to be on board to, to give the, the, the real training, you know. Uh, that, that the academics can get, you know, the academics can approach the academics because what I heard from uh, Dr. Zahir and team is one-to-one -one consultation, which is amazing. I myself could not do a one-to-one -one consultation. So then for, for the near future, I think almost uh, every one of us are ready to go ahead. So maybe can, uh, Dr. Zahir can plan for a group uh, consultation rather than one-to-one uh, -one consultation. Uh, because I think Dr. Zahir a lot more to do beside that <laughs> uh, with the cost buffet and whatnot. Okay, so I believe that I think I, I believe uh, all our academics are very competent. Just to share with you, when I interview a new academics, you know, with my uh, two months experience um, uh, interviewing uh, future academics in UM, they are really motivated and they are ready for all this kind of situation. And uh, I, I believe that uh, young uh, lecturers. You know, they are really competent, digital, um, savvy, you know, uh, not like myself, you know, taking a lot of time to learn certain things. But I believe uh, every one of you, I mean, uh, this is way forward. We, we, can't, we can't ignore anymore. This is not uh, going to be abnormal anymore. It's normal to do all these online activities and meetings. I think sometimes it's effective. Time is good. You know, you can punctual to be there on time doing uh, uh, online uh, meeting, especially in, 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 in certain, uh, not all the things, but you know, most of the meetings you can do it online. I think this is more effective way. At least in the morning, I can do like three, four meetings, you know, not like before. When I have schedule, I can only have maximum two meetings. But with online, sometimes you can go up to four meetings. It's double the numbers. So uh, more effective way in, in, in some ways, lah. it's not all, eh? All right, so I hope that it will answer some of that questions too. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Prof. And thanks a lot, Dr. Zahi. I know you've been doing a lot of hard work trying to enhance our learning, so I really appreciate that as well. Thank you. All right, you're, you're welcome, uh, Doctor. Uh, so the next person uh, raising the hand is uh, Dr. Uh, Rutun Jaya. Uh, do I, yes, do you have? Do okay. I have? Okay. okay, you can hear Sorry. me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry if I okay. uh, so, from. <laughs> yeah, so actually I'm from Department Physics. All right. Okay, so here there is a very nice discussion regarding the uh, student teaching assistantship. So here I want to uh, add a point. Uh, basically, if you're going to, for example, nowadays also the funding is also one of the top competitions. Sometimes also some of the field uh, uh, we are going for the competition, but we do not get. Sometimes also some students have the interest to join that field, but due to no funding, so unable to join. Then they suppress their interest either, or maybe they change the field for the financial support from some of the projects they're going to join like that way. So uh, here, uh, basically, if you are looking at uh, some of the... Uh, uh, same standard of university from internationally, they have some uh, more departmentally or a faculty level, they have some positions which is assigned uh, to the each, uh, each department, for example, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, all departments like it. Some certain number of students like one or two or three in a year like that, they can join to the PhD program and they can support the teaching either in the laboratory or maybe they go to the class in the lower level uh, in the first year or something, they can also uh, take the help to that and they get some of the fellowships from there like that. 
so this kind of assistance is not only a growth of the research as well as also it is help to the those who do not have the problem they can also get a student second things all the student get the assistance which will be helpful for him to continue his research career as well so i think the university has to look on this point <laughs> okay. so this uh, this is some suggestions from me i okay. think thank you thank you very much for the uh, the input yes i mean i mean as what uh, uh, one of the one of the options that they have now with our teaching assistance ship schemes all right and uh, that's not uh, i'm not sure how many places are open at the faculty level uh, because it depends on the requirements uh, and and at the same time i believe that uh, for for students you know that's why i said i mean um, uh, I, I would like to uh, I've spoken to the deans yesterday uh, during our uh, deans uh, uh, DVCA meeting uh, that uh, especially on the postgraduate, on the postgraduate training or assistantship or even uh, facilities provided by PTJ must be um, at place because uh, I think uh, we would like students to come back and do their work you know, uh, in university and we have to be prepared. After two years of this uh, pandemic situation, I think some of the labs is not actively um, uh, um, doing their work in, in research, basically in a lab. So I hope that with these coming back students that we want to make uh, our, especially labs in the Faculty of Science more lively. And, and uh, again, the assistantship needed, lah, uh, and some financial assistance as well. Uh, we look into that, uh, uh, I, I will check because we have GRA, we have GRAS, we have a teaching assistantship. Uh, we also are now offering a scholarship to students. So I think that's uh, some of the initiatives we made at the uh, central level. So I hope that uh, that information maybe you can get from our AASC uh, to see what are the opportunities given uh, for this uh, financial assistantship in terms of the scholarship or sponsorship. Okay. Yes, uh, no doubt it will be a successive program because uh, the fellowship also very small amount, 2000 or something for the students like in the PhD level, 2000, 2100 or something like this. And uh, with that amount of uh, uh, money, they also do their own research. Not only they go for only teaching assistantship, they can register for the PhD program. And also they continue their PhD as well as also they do some uh, teaching, uh, teaching assistance like mostly they have to help in the laboratory. Laboratory is very easy for them to handle with the other students and also it is more time to sit there. They do their own work as well as also do the uh, do the help to the and it is also reduce the uh, load workload for the faculty. They yeah. basically go for the course teaching in the classroom. And laboratory will be free with the students, and yeah. only come out, come over like in some laboratory they have assigned like two three faculty. Then no need because student will assistant only one faculty going to supervise. That's fine. He, uh, that is fine for uh, the student as well as for the faculty. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Hope yeah. it will be going to work out. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you. So um, I would like to count to 10 uh, and see whether who, who else uh, want to raise their hand. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So uh, uh, no more questions. Um, uh, from the uh, participants from the floor. So uh, again, uh, uh, representing EDEC, we would like to uh, 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 give uh, our special thanks to uh, Prof. Yatima for um, agreeing to have this engagement session and with uh, the whole of the campus university, the, the, the grassroots lecturers. Uh, who uh, is the one uh, like, um, engaging with the students and also um, trying to um, uh, get around the, the kind of flexibility and also transformation that we uh, need to embrace uh, going forward into the future to enhance the learning experience of our uh, students. Uh, they are, they are, they are, they are. So, so, so that then when they graduate, so their degree becomes actually uh, very, very useful and also very, very, very valuable uh, uh, with the potential employees and also probably potential business collaborators. 
So uh, 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 we have enjoyed this uh, almost two uh, hours uh, of, of sessions. I, I would say it's a very lively session. Uh, we have uh, questions from uh, different uh, faculties, uh, different uh, the people, uh, and also the uh, the, the follow up questions uh, from uh, what uh, from Doctor what, what Prof Yatima uh, has also said is uh, it shows to uh, to me at least is uh, we have people who are passionate uh, uh, in and there are a lot of people who are passionate uh, in uh, getting and giving the best uh, student experience uh, for uh, our students and also at the same time supporting and also. Uh, 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 sort of having an ownership of UM's transformation plan or UM and, and UM strategy plan. That's something that we want to see um, uh, going forward into the future. So, uh, last words from you, uh, Prof. Yatima. <laughs> thank you. I think I would like to thank uh, Dr. Zahe and team okay, and EDEC, you know, we are actually working very hard to make sure that uh, uh, the teaching and learning training and uh, uh, skills and experience, you know, being handled by, by EDEC. Thank you very much, Zahi and team. And I think to all the academics here, together with me, I really appreciate that you spend time and hear what's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the more interactive or more sharing session. This is more on sharing session. And I believe this is a very good platform to actually to share with you what, what, I'm what we are going to do in the next uh, couple of years. And, and uh, definitely, uh, I really hope that the, all the academics will be supporting the management and the team uh, and making sure that uh, we're producing a uh, leader for the futures. So I think this is what uh, what I get. And, 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 uh, and most of the important uh, aspects that uh, we would like to uh, emphasize is on the teaching and learning. Definitely, this is what, you know, making sure that the teaching and learning delivery method and assessment uh, is, uh, is 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 ongoing and uh, coming up with more and more innovative and creative uh, approach on, on, on that. So all the best to you all. Thank you very much. Salam Ramadan. Inshallah, Salam Hari Raya. Maaf Zaibatin to all. Thank you very much. <laughs>